All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. And thank you for joining us this evening for the second in our student research speaker series. Um, this is a new speaker series that's co-sponsored by the Hudson River Watershed Alliance and THIRST. THIRST stands for the Hudson River Subwatershed and Tributary Research Network. This is a partnership of institutions working in watersheds and sharing common methodologies to answer research questions of both scientific and community significance. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance, if you're not familiar with us, is a nonprofit that works throughout the Hudson River watershed to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources. So we're really excited uh, to have here tonight uh, students and faculty from Siena College to speak about their on-campus wastewater surveillance program for COVID-19. And this is a really great project that was really student driven. Um, and I think there are a lot of really important lessons learned for those of us um, who are concerned about COVID-19, who are interested in wastewater, and especially for those who might be implementing similar programs. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Cassidy Hamaker, Jason Golden, and Dr. Kate Meyerdirks from Siena College to give their presentation. All right, so this is Siena College's COVID-19 wastewater surveillance with some lessons learned from the field and implications for watershed communities. As Emily said, I'm Jason and with me is Cassidy and Dr. Myers. So just a couple of key points that we wanna go over during the course of this presentation is that there are many communities all around the world actually that are monitoring their wastewater for the presence of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 to aid with public efforts uh, during the pandemic. Uh, colleges and universities such as Siena are using the wastewater surveillance programs in conjunction with clinical testing to help avoid outbreaks, to monitor infection rates, and to identify and isolate infected individuals. The grassroots program here at Siena began as a result of an undergrad summer research project and has since developed into a collaborative effort between faculty, students, staff, and administrators, though the actual collection of wastewater is still largely managed and run by undergrad students. Our wastewater surveillance program has been successful with modest expertise in funding, largely due to its ability to grow and adapt, our dedicated core team, and strategic partnerships. The lessons learned from surveillance programs like those at Siena may be particularly helpful for smaller watershed communities and those with limited large-scale clinical testing capacity and resources. So just for a quick overview of what we plan to cover, start with the overview of how wastewater collection surveillance works, and then a look at the wastewater surveillance program at Siena. Cassidy will go over the day-to-day -day implementation as well as her perspective on lessons from the field. I will follow up by looking at some of the data we received, and Dr. Meyer Dirks will continue with college level lessons learned from the fall semester and as we continue to look ahead into the spring and beyond, before finally closing with implications for watershed communities. So, for our overview of wastewater surveillance, um, the SARS CoV 2 RNA is able to be shed from symptomatic and pre-symptomatic carriers and be, can be detected in wastewater. So by sampling the wastewater from residence halls on campus, we can find or identify hot locations for, or that contain the COVID RNA. Uh, and we collect the wastewater from an individual building or a cluster of buildings. And then with this information about suspected infections, we can then direct our on-campus testing resources to a more focused inspection of residents from those areas. And this is all part of our larger surveillance program to identify and isolate infected individuals and stop the spread before it even starts. So there's some benefits of wastewater surveillance um, in general. Wastewater surveillance acts as an early warning to catch asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic individuals, as Jason just mentioned. And this is because 
Um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA, it can be detected in our bodies like up to three weeks before we start showing symptoms. And it catches people who don't even know they have symptoms. Um, it's non-invasive and it's a pool surveillance strategy. So it really covers a large area. And trends can be monitored. An uptick in the amount of SARS-CoV-2 RNA is typically correlated to a rise in infection rates. Um, in addition, trends of SARS-CoV-2 RNA can also verify that infection rates are declining due to some intervention or enhanced clinical testing um, implemented. And it's also less dependent on external factors like access to testing resources. So for example, individuals or institutions might not have access to health and care insurance um, that covers nasal testing or transportation to clinical testing sites. Um, so there are also factors of geographical location or status present with clinical testing um, that applies less so with wastewater surveillance. Uh, now let's talk about some basic reactions to surveillance results that can benefit overall public health. Um, targeted messaging can reinforce mitigation practices such as social distancing, masking, hand washing, everything we've been doing for a year now. Um, and it can direct available clinical testing resources to those hot areas that Jason mentioned and additional controls and restrictions on movement and interaction. Um, but it's really best paired with clinical testing. So the goal is overall to identify and isolate infected individuals. Um, and although this is the intended goal for both clinical testing and wastewater testing, um, each have their gaps in doing so. And we call this the Swiss cheese model. So there's holes in clinical testing, such as false negatives, low compliance, and inability to test all individuals, as I was just talking about. And there's holes in wastewater too. It requires that an infected individual uses a restroom in their dorm during the 24 hours that we are sampling. And there's also environmental factors that come in place, um, such as this morning, we were testing at one of our locations and the wind blew over our sampler, so that sample was no good. So neither strategy is 100% effective 100% of the time, but by layering them, we're closing those holes and um, we're, we can reduce vulnerabilities and increase the likelihood of identifying infected individuals. So let's talk about um, COVID wastewater surveillance programs, specifically at Siena College. So the wastewater program at Siena started in the fall of 2020, um, but to, let's take a look at what has already been done here. So we collected wastewater samples from manholes over a 24 hour period once a week. So we started sampling on Monday mornings. We actually started with one sample location and we ended the program with nine total sample locations um, and a two to six person field crew overall. Five samples were collected with the help of Adirondack Environmental Services using their composite samplers, and four samples collected using DIY samplers, which were constructed with a pool pump and a drink cooler. And we'll talk about that next, it's pretty cool. Um, samples were sent to Quadratic Biosciences in Syracuse, and that was on Tuesday morning. And results returned in 24 to 48 hours um, thereafter. So it was a pretty quick turnaround period. And results were shared with the Siena community through the COVID-19 dashboard, which just showed overall positive cases, upticks and trends to the whole community. All right, so our, our DIY equipment, um, this was, we got help from the Dean of School of Science, um, John Cummings, and it was adapted from our general scientific literature review. So all you really need is a five gallon um, Gatorade jug and a pool pump. Within the Gatorade jug, there's a glass jar. And within the sewer, there's a filter that's attached to tubing. So the wastewater comes up through the tubing into the pool pump. The pool pump pumps it, pumps it into the glass jar. And that's our sample. And the glass jar um, is surrounded by ice within the Gatorade jug. So that keeps it at the appropriate temperature. And then the only thing else you need is a manhole hook and a power source, and you're all set. And that costs around $600. So it was significantly cheaper than outsourcing. Um, and another benefit was that it was really understandable. It was easy to run. So within the pump, there's a dial to control the speed at which it pumps. 
and there's an on and off switch and that's really all there is to it. You make sure it's on the right speed and you flick it on and that's it. So it was pretty easy. Um, and we're also, it, um, it's independent from any other people. So we can sample whenever we would like to, um, where we would like to. So there, and there's also no supply chain issues there. However, it is less mechanical. So it's more dependent on flicking that switch, turning that knob at the right time, um, making sure that it's at the right speed. So um, that is one weakness, but overall it was a pretty easy setup and it was definitely manageable. So lessons learned in the field. Um, I really wanna hone in on the ease of this project um, because my field experiences have taught me just how practical this method of testing is. Um, so first of all, it was a little daunting to work with wastewater, um, especially as an undergrad. I'm only a junior here at Siena. Um, however, none of us were masters coming into this. None of us had a degree in wastewater service research or um, experience with wastewater. Those quick to learn. Um, the learning steep, the learning steep wasn't curve, the learning curve wasn't steep. The biggest possible learning difficulty um, was just getting adjusted to the equipment um, and the safety protocol um, and the schedule of like the real field work. So in the field, there were some learning curves, but they were not steep. And it was also easy for the college to set up. All it took was um, some research done by Dr. Meyerdirks and my fellow summer scholars team. But once we dove in the research, we found out what's due, we developed a game plan and we moved on. Um, so it's easy to set up. And I also found that students could really do this on their own. So there were times that Dr. Meyerdirks had to leave for class, um, to go teach a class early, and we were able to take over and finish the project. Um, so there's something to be noted about that. So overall, it was really manageable. It did not take a lot of time. It was only an hour or two at maximum on Monday and Tuesdays. And we still had time for all of our courses and our education at Siena. So it's a really quick process in the field, um, quick setup, quick collection. And there's also wiggle room for creative solutions um, that, to challenges that we faced. For example, um, at first the tubing would be wired through the manhole cover. Um, however, messing with the tubing after we put the sample in um, changed the location of the filter at the bottom of the wastewater hole. So we decided to put a um, we decided to put wood in between the manhole opening and the cover to make sure that the tubing had a place to come up without getting moved around or pinched or anything like that. Um, so and it wasn't that's not it didn't take a lot of brain work to really figure figure out any any problems. Um, so any troubleshooting was really manageable in the field work itself. Um, so there that was that didn't stop us from anything. Um, but the most important or even difficult aspect of this field work was coming up with a field plan that was most efficient and to stay mindful of the little things during field work. Um, and it was those little things during the field work, those moving parts, uh, make sure everything came together that really made a difference um, on Siena's campus and kept us on campus. So the Siena community, um, overall, we had really impressive numbers last fall, despite some Halloween upticks and things like that that Jason will talk about later. Overall, we got to stay on campus the whole semester and these impressive numbers brought a lot of press interest. We had Times Union and Spotlight News um, come interview with us. So that was really a great marketing byproduct for Siena. So um, what President Gibson put into this project, he got a lot out of. Um, and a few people did not ruin it for everyone. And I think that's really important. Not a lot of colleges can say that they stayed open and their campus life was pretty good <laughs> um, with the situation that we are in. So overall, there was a day-to-day -day feeling of safety and confidence in our school. Um, and then the whole Siena community was overall more positive because those numbers were lower and we were on campus. And it was also an amazing undergraduate opportunity for students to get field work with outside companies and collaborate with a true field team. Um, that's something that not a lot of schools have to offer. And so that was a really great opportunity for undergrads. 
And Dr. Myerix and I always say that this is the next best public health tool, and we really believe that. So then there were some considerations going into this um, before we could step foot in the field. Um, the biggest one was safety. So according to CDC, um, in our own scientific literature review, while SARS-CoV-2 can be shed in feces of individuals with COVID-19, there's no information to date that anyone has become sick with COVID-19 because of direct exposure to treated or untreated wastewater. So there's been little to no literature that says anything about fecal oral transmission. So our, our field crew, we just wore our proper PPE for handling wastewater and opening a manhole. And that consisted of um, our surgical masks, rubber gloves, goggles, gowns, and steel-toed boots, especially when working with the manhole. Um, but safety protocols were reviewed by the Santa School of Science Safety Committee. And Adirondack Environmental Services were really great about giving us field training um, and advice in the field um, when we needed it. And there's more guidance available through the CDC website on workers and waste. And so another consideration was of ethical standing. So there's an issue of who owns the wastewater, especially when dealing with a larger area um, and informed flushing. So when you flush the toilet, knowing that that's being researched on. So there's trade-offs between transparency, sensitivity, and privacy there. Um, so there's limits on sample and data collection, use and sharing, which also must be considered to prevent undermining privacy and autonomy in order to implement these public health strategies that are consistent with legal and ethical considerations. At Siena, we, um, the qualitative results were shared on the public dashboard, which was the COVID-19 dashboard that I talked about earlier. Um, and that was for populations greater than 200, but not for smaller congregate settings. And there was no data about individual affections. So there was no um, linkage of positive cases to a specific individual. And I'll hand it off to Jason now to talk about um, all the, that data. So before I get into the data, uh, this is just an overview of where we sampled around campus. This is basically all of Siena. And as you can see, it consists of most of it. Um, the one site I think of importance is what Cassidy mentioned earlier, the Gulf Center, the one in the middle right there. It collected most of the dorm places on campus besides the Friary, uh, McCluskey, and Cushing, which are both townhouse villages, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so from the data we got back, we were able to determine for each site if no SARS CoV-2 RNA is detected, which we'll indicate as green. If the RNA is detected, but not quantifiable, which means it is at a level near the detection limit of the instrument used. And then red would be if the RNA is detected and quantifiable. So what we can do is then compare at what levels the CoV-2 RNA is detected at each dorm, and then compare it with the positive cases on campus to try and analyze it for any trends. But first, uh, the actual process of the RNA extraction, uh, it's used with an RT-Q-PCR test, which is very similar to uh, the clinical tests. Um, so with the diagram on the right, it starts with collecting the wastewater and then from that RNA extraction, and then through reverse transcription, cDNA is made, which then the RT-Q-PCR test is able to amplify it. Um, so three tests are done to copy the cDNA. And if three out of three of those tests are positive for the COVID RNA, and they're all at above five genome copies per milliliter, we are able to quantify the concentration. It's also important to measure the CRAS phage fecal marker to normalize the COVID RNA concentration. Since everyone has CRAS phage RNA in their feces, uh, it's important to figure out if there was a lot of fecal matter that had COVID in it, and we can find that out by comparing it with how much of the CRAS phage there was. Um, as stated before, individuals who may shed the virus in their feces can be found several days before they could ever receive a positive clinical test. 
and they could also be shedding the virus for several weeks after they recover. Uh, one of the issues right now, though, is that there is no way to estimate the number of infected individuals because there's just so much variability in the amount of virus that each person can shed in their feces. So taking a look at the fall, uh, we have the graph of positive cases on campus from our COVID-19 dashboard. Um, some of the questions we posed was, how well do the clinical testing results and the wastewater results correlate? Do we see evidence of enhanced mitigation strategies in both of the results? And that would refer to that uh, two week of enhanced mitigation, where from October 3rd to October 17th, October 17th, we went into two weeks of a soft lockdown where between building travel was restricted and the only dining options were takeout. And then do we see evidence of potential super spreader events like the Halloween weekend, where we would expect cases to rise because unfortunately people were probably still hanging out uh, and partying regardless of restrictions. So for this slide, we have two of the freshman dorms being Hines and Ryan. Um, for the most part, they're mostly green. And I want to bring attention to Heinz on the left, where it seems to almost perfectly follow the upticks of the clinical testing on the bottom uh, compared to the wastewater on the top. So when uh, for the wastewater, it started to become detected, we see a rise in positive cases around September 22nd. And then during the soft lockdown at the beginning of October, cases or the wastewater goes back to not detected before then. Uh, after Halloween, where cases rise, wastewater detection also rises. Next, yeah. And then, which is in complete con contrast to the upper classmen townhouses, which is a collection of buildings that was all tested together. Uh, from week three, the September 29th, they're mostly red for the entire time, even during the soft lockdown. And it's only around Halloween for both of them that we see the co yeah, the wastewater start to go down a little bit before it finally rises again. But it doesn't really correlate with the results that we would expect with a super spreader event. So to answer our questions, how well do they relate to each other? It's just right now with our technology, it's really hard to tell. One of the issues with wastewater testing is that even if someone is no longer showing symptoms and cannot spread it to others, it can still be shed in their feces. And if someone had it for two weeks, they're still going to be shedding it. Um, so there's no way to know right now if the two really correlate together. Do the enhanced mitigation strategies work? Well, for the clinical testing, yes, we did see that cases seem to, positive cases seem to go down um, on campus, but for the wastewater results, if the wastewater was green, it would stay green, and when it was red, it would stay red. Do we see evidence of the super spreader events? It looks like the clinical tests did rise, as did the positivity rate in the community, but for whatever reason, the upperclassmen townhouses actually went down after Halloween. And there's just a lot of issues right now with uncertainties in the data and with privacy. But Siena and other colleges have actually reported that they've been able to identify one or more asymptomatic individual and even just stopping one person before they start being able to spread is enough to possibly prevent an outbreak. So when looking at what comes next, we're going to continue to monitor in the same way with the same numbers in the data that we've been receiving. But we're also going to be looking at whether less of a quanti qualitative look at the COVID data, whether or not we can see it, but more of a qualitative, we're gonna to look to see if the amount of the RNA detected is going up and down, and that could be a good indication of if people are still getting the virus. And we're also going to up the sampling to twice a week so that we can try to better monitor trends, which may also provide additional insight. All right, so thank you, Jason. So 
Um, I just want to add that Jason has really just started to dive into these data. And um, as we collect more data this spring, and especially with the twice weekly sampling, um, he's going to continue to analyze it. So I'm sure he'll come up with even more insights um, that we'll be able to share down the road. So um, Jason and Cassidy, I think, did a really nice job at presenting an overview of wastewater surveillance and also how wastewater surveillance is being used at Siena. What I wanted to do was take a step back a little bit or, or zoom out, if you will, and talk about lessons learned at the college level um, and particularly how the lessons that we've learned at Siena could be useful for an individual or an institution or, or an organization that is thinking about doing wastewater surveillance in their own community. So, all right, of course, I'm the one with technology issues. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so a little bit of context. So how did Sienna embrace, or why did Sienna embrace wastewater surveillance in the fall semester? Well, it all began during the summer, there was some real concern on campus um, over Siena's clinical testing resources and their plan for clinical surveillance. You know, we weren't one of the big universities. We didn't have the resources to test every single student, you know, every other day. Um, and so wastewater, wastewater surveillance was discussed as a way to kind of fill those gaps, as, as Cassidy mentioned, kind of that the idea of that Swiss cheese model. I think the other reason that, that Siena has really embraced wastewater surveillance is this idea that it was a student initiated project. So as Cassidy mentioned, she and another student um, started doing research over the summer about how wastewater surveillance could be implemented at Siena. Um, we pitched that idea to President Gibson and, and he said, yes, he gave us the go ahead. And I think it just speaks to this idea that, that Sienna and, and President Gibson in particular really want to support student initiatives. So it was a win-win situation. Now, looking ahead to the fall, how wastewater surveillance was used at Sienna, as was mentioned, is, was really to target that clinical testing to specific dorms, right? So we started off the semester with um, let's say we had about 60 clinical tests for the week. And, and I mean, that was kind of a typical number. So if we were going to randomly assign those clinical tests to the entire student population, what that meant is that we were only going to be able to test 2% of the students that week. But let's say we got um, some hot water at uh, dorm A, what we could do was then direct all of those, those 60 clinical tests to that one dorm. And what that meant is that instead of testing 2% of the students in, the, in that dorm, we could then test 20%. And therefore, um, really increasing the likelihood that we would be able to catch an infected individual. Now for spring, um, this semester, we just started on Monday, or we have a, a lot more clinical testing resources. So you could make the argument, okay, we have a lot more clinical tests. Um, maybe we don't need wastewater surveillance, but you know, as Cassidy pointed out, there's still those holes in, in the clinical testing. So we're continuing the wastewater. We're actually increasing the wastewater sampling and um, we are still going to direct clinical testing resources based on the wastewater results. Um, and also, as Jason mentioned, by looking at those trends, um, the goal is to um, look for upticks in, in um, the SARS-2 RNA and hopefully prevent the outbreak. Now, looking ahead, how could wastewater surveillance be used even beyond the spring semester? And you know, we may want to decide to continue wastewater surveillance, especially in the, in the fall, if most students, faculty, and staff are vaccinated and we're no longer doing the clinical surveillance. Waste mod wastewater surveillance might be a good way just to kind of get a sense of um, how we're doing on campus. We also have the structure in place. You know, heaven forbid we have a, another pandemic. Wastewater surveillance has been used um, for cholera outbreaks, typhoid outbreaks, polio outbreaks, 
salmonella outbreaks, um, influenza. So there's lots of oppor opportunities there for public health. And then um, another reason why we might wanna be continuing to use wastewater is um, there's been several research labs that have detected COVID variants in wastewater. Um, and so there's been a couple news articles about that. So even before it was detected in the clinical testing, uh, the clinical tests, um, researchers have uh, detected variants in the wastewater. Okay, so Siena has kind of embraced this wastewater surveillance program. Um, we've been able to continue the program now into the spring semester. And this next slide, you know, as we're in the field and, and talking about what works for our wastewater surveillance program, it's a little different than what you might hear, you know, at your typical wastewater surveillance webinar, which you might read um, in a newspaper article. You know, often you hear that in order to do wastewater surveillance, you need all of this expertise. So you need expertise in wastewater collection and handling, analytical methods, public health. Um, you know, a lot of the wastewater surveillance is being run by the state or these big research uni universities. But, you know, the point that, that Cassidy made is that really our team had none of these. I mean, I'm a, I'm a watershed person, but I had never even really thought about doing wastewater research until the summer. So we, <laughs> we don't have the same level, level, of, level of expertise as some other colleges and universities, but what we lack in expertise, we make up in pure grit. So why has the program been successful at Siena? And I really think it's due to this dedicated core team, right? Not only the physical support, like helping and, and collect those samples, but the emotional support, um, the ability to wear hats, you know, as Cassidy mentioned, you have to troubleshoot out in the field. You have to propose how this data could be used for um, public health measures. Um, and I also think this ability to grow and adapt. Um, so the weekly uh, sampling plan can change last minute. So sometimes we're making decisions about where to sample, how to sample at 1030 on a Sunday night, and we have to be ready to implement those at by 8 a.m. the next morning. Um, and then finally, strategic partnerships. So what we lacked um, in technical expertise, we made up for by um, building strategic partnerships and so some of those partnerships include things like um, the students and faculty working with engineering contractors. We've worked really closely with the college emergency management team, really thinking about how the wastewater data could be most helpful for them. Um, we partnered with the lab. Um, Sienna facilities helped us um, map out the sewer network, the safety committee, communications, how to talk about this data on the website. Um, but I, I will say, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do this without all the strategic partnerships. But the caveat here is that, you know, the, the more partners you have, the more moving pieces. And this is what Cassie was talking about. You know, the more partners you have, the more moving pieces that need to come together by 8 a.m. on that Monday morning sampling. Okay, so that is some of the lessons learned from from Siena, what we wanted to do for this presentation is think about our experiences here at Siena and how that might be useful for a watershed community, um, a watershed community that's a little bit smaller or might not have um, access to lots of clinical testing. And so, you know, the point here is that uh, Siena's experience might be particularly relevant to those communities. Um, we didn't have a lot of funding. We didn't have a lot of expertise as some of the big universities did, but we made it work. And, and we think that you can too, if you have these certain ingredients, um, recipe, and then you know, the budget is, is a big point as well, right? So the ingredients, you know, we think that if you have some of the same ingredients that we had at Siena, you could make this work, right? So that's the ability to adapt. Um, <laughs> the the 1030 emails, um, changing things on the fly. Uh, you have to have your core team, you need your squad um, to troubleshoot with those strategic partnerships. And so, you know, the expertise is preferred, but it's certainly not required. And um, 
we think if you have those, if you follow some steps for implementing and executing your, your program, it can work. And then I added this, the budget here on this first page because this could be a deal breaker, right? So the budget for a wastewater surveillance program is on the order of, it can be anywhere between $100 to $1,000 per sample. Um, and so let me talk about how we got that number. So um, the cost, you know, the 100 to 1,000 um, budget, it really depends on your goals and your sampling plan. So if you just have one location that you want to sample once per week, you, know, you might find that it's, um, you know, budget is quite reasonable. Available la labor. So we worked with um, students. Um, they do a lot of the field sampling. Um, faculty worked on this. All the faculty time is donated. Um, and a lot of the work that we did was in-house versus through contractors. So we identified the sample locations, um, prepped everything. Um, so we did a lot of the, the in-house stuff for the sampling. You, you know, we built our own samplers. Um, startup costs. So Cassidy mentioned that we made our own samplers. Um, they cost about $600. If you wanted to buy the industry standard, which is the, that ISCO sampler down there, um, it's about $6,000. You're also, you might not be able to find it right now. I know at least in the summer and the fall when we were thinking about growing our program, those samplers weren't available. Um, or you could do a, a grab sample or a more sample where you're just sticking a bucket or some gauze into the manhole. Um, sample collection can be anywhere between tens of dollars, hundreds of dollars. The lab analysis, depending on whether or not you're doing in-house or partnering, partnering with a university can be tens of dollars versus a commercial lab, which can be about 300. And then of course the, the labor. So the labor is not factored into that, that 100 to $1,000 cost. Okay, so, so the recipe here. Um, so this is what we did at Siena and we thought it could work for a watershed community, right? So we started off over the summer assembling our core team identifying partnerships. We worked with um, the emergency management team at Siena to decide where we were going to test and how we were going to use the data. Um, we determined the population and the time scale, right? So we, we looked at whether or not we could test every single townhouse. And that was just going to be, that's, that's what Siena wanted to do. They wanted to test every single townhouse. That was not going to be possible. So we tested dorm clusters, um, but a community, they could, they could test anywhere from a wastewater treatment plant to a congregate living um, setting. So we do test a building where it's um, congregate, so less than 200 people living there. Just decide weekly to daily. Find and evaluate your sample locations. That can be pretty tricky. You want to work with someone who knows the pipe network. Contract with your laboratory. Um, contract with a wastewater engineer. That's really important. They provide safety training they can rent you the equipment, they helped us troubleshoot, and then interpret use and communicate the results. And so some parting words. Um, so at least I feel when reading about wastewater surveillance, it can be really intimidating at first, especially if you don't have any wastewater experience, especially if you don't have any public health um, experience, but we really do truly feel that Implementing a, a successful wastewater um, treatment program is achievable with a modest, modest budget and expertise um, if you follow our, our, our recipe um, and you have the right ingredients. But I, I will say, you know, Cassidy and Jason make it look so easy, but I will say before you dive into wastewater sampling, just know it is physically, intellectually, and emotionally exhausting work. Um, it's I mean, it can be really tough, and um, but it's so worth it. So the benefits to the community, the benefits to us personally, um, outweigh any of those negatives. So just a few quotes from the students who work on this um, project, right? I'll I'll end with with Cassie, who who said in one of our Siena newsletters, right? 
So no amount of appraisal can match the immense feeling of pride and satisfaction that summer research has given me. The knowledge and skill set I have developed are so valuable and the work we did will make such a difference for our community and the environment. Nothing beats the feeling of all that work coming together and being applied. So I will end there by just acknowledging everybody who um, contributed to this project. There's Jen and Annie, they were out with us early this morning. Um, you know, everybody who worked on the field, out in the field, helping us map the, um, the pipe network, our Siena colleagues. Um, the wastewater surveillance academic community was tremendous. Everybody was so generous and donating their time to talk with us um, to figure out how we could make this work at Siena. Um, I have a document with works cited and references that I'm going to ask Emily to put in the chat so um, you can take a look at some of the resources that we that we we found helpful um, when we were building our program and putting together this presentation. And then finally, if you have any questions, um, feel free to email me at any point. So I think that is. Great, thank you so much, uh, Kate, Cassidy, and Jason, and the whole team who put all this work together. Um, so we'll go ahead and take questions now from you um, with the remaining time. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it into the Q&A box that's on the panel at the bottom of your screen. And while you're maybe thinking of your questions, I'm gonna just mention that in a couple of weeks, uh, Thursday, March 11th, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance has our regular breakfast lecture series, and we have Dr. David Larson coming to present on COVID surveillance. I'm gonna drop a link to the, in the chat there to register if you're interested. That's from 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning, our regular breakfast lecture series. So if you have, uh, really tough questions. <laughs> David, Dr. Larson is really the expert, um, it, sort of nationally known for this work and um, save them if, if we can't get to them or we can't answer them here and please bring them to our breakfast lecture in a couple weeks. Um, so I see that we've got some questions coming in um, and a comment that says, this is awesome, great work. I completely agree. <laughs> um, okay, so Cassidy said that an infected person starts shedding SARS-CoV-2 virus three weeks prior to the onset of symptoms. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's correct. So the, the virus is um, live in our bodies and can be shed before we start showing symptoms. And I can put the resource that I got that information from into that Google Doc um, that Dr. Meyer shared with us. Um, but it averages about three weeks prior um, to when you can start showing symptoms. So you're not infectious during that period of time. It's just, it's almost as if it's setting in to your body. Great. Um, can you talk about how this research came about? Was this part of a class? Is this part of an, an independent study? What was the structure for the project? Yeah, so um, I can answer that one. We started with Summer Scholars, um, which is a program that allows students to pair up with a professor and do research. And it's in the summer and the winter. Um, and then we just kind of started with this project. So it's not part of a class, um, but it's just something that students were able to initiate and get going on Sienna's campus. So um, it is counted for like a work study type of thing with um, Dr. Meyerks. Great. Can you talk a little more about the SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants that are found in wastewater? How are those identified? Um, what is that process like? <laughs> Dr. M, if you wanna take that one. I, I promise I wouldn't talk unless Cassidy and Jason called on me. Professors love to talk. Um, so that is a, that's going to be an excellent question for Dave Larson. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I did when I did call the lab that we're working with um, out in Syracuse. I asked um, about whether or not I, everybody was asking me about variants, um, and so they said that they're looking into it. 
Um, but the, their ability to test for variants won't be commercially available um, until sometime in the future. So I, I really can't talk to this about, I can't speak to the science of it. Um, all I can say is that, that Dave Larson is gonna be a great person to ask that question to. So I'm deflecting. Great. I, I'm sure it's emerging science as well. So we'll, we'll bring that question to him. Okay, great. Um, the CDC recommends the following PPE when working with wastewater. We've got goggles, protective face mask, or splash proof face shield, liquid repellent coveralls, waterproof gloves, and rubber boots. Did you guys use all these when sampling or working with samples? I can take that one too. Um, so yes, however, it was different with setting up versus your collection. Um, and it kind of depended, uh, depended on how close you're getting to the manhole, um, how close you're getting to the wastewater, um, hands-on. But yes, it's always the face mask, always the eye goggles, um, gloves. And rather than rubber boots, since we're working with a manhole and the cover is really heavy, it can be about 50 pounds, I think, um, definitely steel-toed boots rather than rubber boots. Can I add just one thing, Cassie? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so those are the CDC recommendations and kind of the philosophy here, the, the, the safety philosophy. Those are the CDC recommendations and that's what we put in the training for the students and all of that PPE is available to anyone who wants to use it for wastewater surveillance. The reality is when you're out in the field, right? So like even today, using the face mask and the goggles, they get really foggy. So when you're out there doing this work, the philosophy then becomes, what do I need to be as safe as possible out in the field? And so if you're wearing goggles and you can't see and, you get, and that's why you get wastewater splashed on you, it defeats the purpose of having the, the goggles. Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, and it also depends on what you have available, right? So we like to use disposable um, lab coats, but we got the last three lab coats on campus. So a lot of times when you see news articles, you see folks in like full hazmat suits. And, you know, it could be that that's what their safety committee says you need to wear. It could also be that that's what they had available. Um, so that's what they're using. Face shields. We have one face shield for the whole team. If someone wants to wear it, it's available. Um, but yeah. Great, thank you. Um, on one of the slides, you listed a couple of studies mentioning SARS-CoV-2 variants in wastewater. Would you be able to share those article links? Yeah, Dr. M, I think you have those article links. So yeah. And I'm planning um, as well to send, we're, we're recording this session. Uh, I'll be sending around an email with a link to that along with the work cited and resources document. It, it's in the chat right now, but if you didn't get to it, I'll be sending around a package and I'm happy to include some of those articles as well. Okay. Uh, were your samples grab samples or composite samples collected over longer time periods? Uh, Jason, do you want to do you want to speak about this one? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, I don't actually know the how much was collected over, but it was a composite sampler over the course of 24 hours from Monday morning to Tuesday morning. Um, I don't know how much was taken every couple of minutes, but it was over the course of the 24 hours to get as much of an accurate representation of the dorm building's wastewater. Yeah, so let me, I'm going to expand on that. Thanks, Jason. Um, so in that glass jar and in, in the comp composite sample, we don't use all of that. We only take 250 milliliters and then pour the rest back into the um, manhole. So. I'll just add the advantage of the DIY is that it's a continuous grabs. It's a 
continuous composite sample. So like the ISCO collects a small volume every 15 minutes or every 15 minutes, not oh so every 15 minutes or DIY, it's a continuous wrap. Well. So I have a question <laughs> and I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask it. So I'm wondering when you started this project, how you communicated with college administration or other faculty or students who might be interested in joining the team how did you introduce this project to them? What were those conversations like? Was there any language or communication tips to share? I mean, it seems like if you roll this out the wrong way, you're going to get an immediate, like a certain type of response, right? What can you tell us about that? I know personally, um, when Dr. M asked me to find some more students, if I knew anyone, um, I phrased it as, you know, come help us, you know, fight COVID or, you know, do, do a good deed. Um, so you kind of phrase it like that, but it's also, it's just such a great opportunity. And I think I was just so excited about it that, you know, if you're, if you're excited and if you say, you know, this is just a really good opportunity for you as an undergraduate, um, that really gets students on board. Oh, I can speak from the, the faculty perspective. I will say that it was pretty tough at the beginning um, to sell wastewater surveillance. And then it was after there was a big news article about, um, what, um, was it Arizona University that um, claimed that they were able to catch uh, one or two asymptomatic individuals and prevent an outbreak in a in um in a dorm so we i think we really needed kind of that personal story that anecdote of how valuable wastewater surveillance is um in order for the campus to really get on board um you know even this idea of filling the gaps with the clinical surveillance there were still folks who um weren't quite on board i i will say in terms of the ethical considerations i didn't do a good enough job um at the beginning, we started with that pilot project. So we were collecting wastewater from a single location um, from the summer. And I, I was just doing my best to get the program up and running. We, um, I felt like we were telling everybody that we were doing wastewater because we were so excited about it, but we presented the results of the pilot project to the faculty. And I will say in particular, the philosophers were kind of concerned about the ethical considerations. And so that was a good, that was a really, really good conversation to have. And we should have had it back in the summer. Um, so that's one kind of lesson learned. And I wish we had done um, the informed flushing conversation earlier. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that's something to think about for folks who are doing this or, or thinking about doing this. We, we got a comment in from Ray Kepner that I just want to read. Uh, it takes special people to work with wastewater, so kudos to you all. Great job. And I agree, Ray. Thanks for saying that. Um, when you were sampling uh, the wastewater, did you test for anything else other than the COVID RNA? Um, any other uh, water quality indicators that might be useful? So I'm, I'm not sure about um pH levels or salinity, phosphorus levels, anything like that. But um, I do know that you get an overall bacterial load um, and then you kind of compare it to the virus load. And I think Dr. Emmer Jason might be able to explain that better. You wanna take that one, please? <laughs> okay, yeah, no, def um, definitely. So, um, you know, lots of people do collect all those other, you know, temperature, pH, all those, all those other water quality parameters. Um, a lot of people measure flow as well, right? Because one of the problems with the, or not one of the problems, but one of the issues with the data that you get back is it just tells you the amount of um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. You don't know if that's because there was just a lot of feces in, in the wastewater, and so that's why you have a lot of the virus or whether or not there's a lot of virus and a little bit of feces. So we do measure that, um, you know, what we, what we call the total viral load. 
So we have a couple measurements of the total viral load. So then, you know, Jason pointed this out. But um, so the idea is that you compare the amount of, of COVID in the wastewater to the total viral load. And so rather than measuring the wastewater flow, that's how we kind of get a sense of, um, uh, that's how we normalize the data. That's how we get a relative sense of, of how much of the, the COVID-2 virus is in there. So to answer your question, Emily, yes, you can measure all of those other, other water quality parameters, but, but you don't have to. And I don't think it adds anything. And really our goal in the field is to streamline things as much as possible. So if we're doing a P, you know, if we're sticking a pH probe down there, that just means we have to um, disinfect it afterwards. And then we have to develop a whole safety protocol for doing that. So streamline, just get what you need um, um, because the data that we get serves our, meets our goals. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. I see that um, Esther Nelson has dropped a link to some resources um, into the chat, but uh, you sent it just to panelists. So if you want to go ahead and send that to pa both panelists and attendees, uh, that would be great. This is a compilation that the New York State Water Resources Institute at Cornell University put together on wastewater surveillance. I'll also include that in my package that I send to everyone to make sure that, that you all get a copy of that as well. Um, Okay, so I think we're just about at time here. Uh, so I just want to thank all of our panelists so much for their work and, and sharing your experiences and your findings. So let's just give them all a big round of applause uh, in our virtual space. Um, they can't hear you, but I'm sure they can feel your applause. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, Kate has provided her contact information, but we really encourage you to jump on our breakfast lecture webinar that's on March 11th, uh, Thursday from 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning. Um, and I can share the registration link with that with all the participants as well. So thank you everyone for joining us um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Cassidy and Jason. Thank you guys. And thanks for everyone who joined us. Yeah, thanks.